afternoon, and uh, welcome to this afternoon's special lecture by Professor Jeff Sachs on the theme of the G20 summit and the world crisis, a topic which is obviously timely and of great significance. Jeff Sachs is the director of the Earth Institute, professor of sustainable development, and professor of health policy and management at Columbia University. He's also a special advisor to the UN Secretary General. From 2002 to 2006, he was director of the UN Millennium Project and special advisor to the then UN Secretary General, Kofi Annan, on the Millennium Development Goals. He's also president and co-founder of Millennium Promise Alliance, a non-profit organization aimed at ending extreme global poverty. He's widely considered, as you all know, to be one of the leading international economic advisors of his generation. He's also one of the leading voices for combining economic development with environmental sustainability. And as director of the Earth Institute, leads large-scale efforts to promote the mitigation of human-induced climate change. In 2004 and 2005, he was named among the 100 most influential leaders in the world by Times Magazine. He's the author of hundreds of scholarly articles and many books, sounds exhausting, including the New York Times bestseller, Commonwealth, New in Paperback, and The End of Poverty, which is about to sell its 100,000th copy in the UK and associated territories alone. He'll speak for about 30 minutes, followed by an opportunity to ask him questions. And at six, we'll move outside the theater for a book signing, so you're welcome to make purchases and sign his book then. It's a great, great pleasure for me to introduce him. He's been here before. We are delighted to have him again. Please join with me in giving him a very warm welcome. David, thank you so much, and thanks to all of you. I really deeply value every chance I get to be at LSE, and throughout my career, I've kind of dated uh, my own cycles uh, professionally to uh, lectures that I've had the chance to give here, and uh, they force me to think hard because this is a very discerning uh, group. And um, so you have to uh, uh, be accurate, and uh, whatever you say, uh, uh, you agonize about for years to come afterwards. Did he get it right or not? Uh, because you all remember uh, if, if, if it was uh, something uh, of interest. And I think today's topic um, is of interest for all of us. And for students here, this will be uh, the grist for your mill for uh, your, uh, for years to come, what's going on in the world right now? Is this a bad uh, business cycle? Uh, is it truly a crisis that merits the comparison with the Great Depression, which is spilling uh, out of uh, virtually every story in recent months? Uh, is this a watershed in economic history? We don't know. Uh, but what could be more important for us than to try to figure this out? And we have to assess what is, uh, uh, what are the, the deeper trends, uh, what's just on the surface right now of these events, uh, especially if we're going to have a chance to uh, have a happier outcome. I think we know already that this is a deep enough crisis that things can go seriously awry in the world. Uh, it said uh, the crises are opportunities, but crises are also crises, I want to remind people. Uh, and uh, more often than not, things go bad in crises. Uh, yes, uh, sometimes uh, good reform can come out of a crisis, important change, but also a lot of suffering. And so we should never be flippant or uh, relax for a moment in the middle of events like this without uh, all the effort we can muster to try to understand what's happening. So I want to give you my version uh, in a, a drama in four acts, as it were, to uh, just summarize for you how I'm understanding the events right now. Uh, they may be a, a wrong perception, but I'm going to come down on the side of a, a number of different arguments. 
uh, that are uh, being made right now because I'm trying to make a diagnosis and I will think out loud for a half an hour with you uh, to uh, explain at least the diagnosis uh, that uh, I'm, I'm reaching on this. Some standard, uh, perhaps some uh, not so standard. So I want to talk about the roots of this crisis. I want to talk about the dynamics of the crisis in the last year and a half as it's become more fulminant. I want to talk about the short-term policy responses, and I want to talk about the longer term. For the roots of the crisis, I believe that it's, uh, it's both conventional uh, and correct to view this as a financial crisis uh, at, uh, in some proximate sense. But I would say that even more than a financial crisis, it's actually a monetary crisis. That the, and the, these are all, I hope, uh, good uh, research papers for you to write, and then you can send me your papers. You were wrong, Professor Sachs. I tried it. It's not correct. But uh, by monetary crisis, I mean uh, that, or the roots being monetary, I mean that I, I would put uh, Greenspan's Fed absolutely at the center of this crisis and the centrality of the role of the dollar uh, as the progenitor of this crisis. And that the basic diagnosis uh, that the Fed was ready to uh, put on the financial accelerator, the monetary accelerator, uh, at any point of a weakening of the US economy really over a 20-year period. But uh, throughout the 1990s and then into uh, the post-dot-com bubble, and post 9-11 bubble as the major uh, instigator of the financial uh, disasters uh, that followed. When the dollar is mismanaged, the whole world economy uh, can go into crisis because the dollar does have a unique uh, and asymmetric role in the world system. And an expansion of the US monetary base and exceptionally easy monetary conditions in the U.S. conduce to a worldwide credit expansion and through exchange rate linkages to currencies that are either tightly tied or loosely tied to the dollar to monetary expansions abroad as countries intervene in their foreign exchange markets. So for me, the starting point of this is a very expansionary monetary policy, not just the famous 1% interest rates of 2002, 2003, and 2004, but basically an attitude towards monetary policy that stretches back from the early 1990s onward, which held that the Fed could stop any downturn and that the role of the Fed was very uh, aggressively countercyclical, uh, and that whenever there was an easing of the US economy, we should put on the accelerator. It's kind of ironic because that policy emerged in the rational expectations era, which uh, had tried to uh, downplay or denigrate the stabilizing uh, potential of uh, monetary policy. But in fact, I think we rarely had a more uh, anti-cyclical monetary policy than during the Greenspan period. I'd say as a general proposition also, since I'm putting a lot of responsibility on on Greenspan for the origin of this, that it is a good example of uh, the basic political logic of term limits for just about everything uh, in politics. Uh, Greenspan was the central bank chairman for 20 years, and that's a bad idea, just like it's a bad idea to have presidents for life or uh, other people who think they own public institutions, because if you're in there for a long time and you are prone to a mistake, you end up making that mistake a long time. And in my view, Greenspan created several bubbles. Uh, he definitely helped to create the East Asian bubble, then the dot-com bubble, then the subprime bubble. That is the one that uh, burst now. So at least three in a row in a decade. Uh, and if there were a rotation of leadership with a different point of view, we'd be much less likely to do it three times in a row. We'd make some other dumb mistake. Uh, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't do it three times in a row with escalating consequences. Now, coupled with this without question was an incredibly lax attitude towards financial regulation. Uh, and this was, uh, of course, uh, partly a competition of New York and London 
uh, extraordinarily unhelpful with both sides uh, bidding to the bottom. So we did really have a race to the bottom of uh, financial uh, deregulation. Uh, and this amplified the monetary expansion. It opened up <coughs> the so-called shadow banking system uh, of Wall Street, which created a whole uh, off-balance sheet, uh, unregulated uh, <coughs> banking sector uh, in the sense of uh, a uh, financial intermediation of very short-term <coughs> borrowing for longer-term finance. But with the banking sector, we learned over 200 years that you don't want an unregulated banking sector. You need deposit insurance. You need a lender of last resort. You need capital adequacy. Those were 200 years of hard-won lessons. But then uh, the laxity of regulation and the competition between financial centers uh, allowed uh, precisely uh, a, a shadow banking sector to arise that had not one of those three uh, uh, constraints. No guaranteed lender of last resort, no capital adequacy standards, no deposit insurance against runs. And sure enough, what happened to the shadow banking system is what used to happen to the normal banking system. It imploded in, in a, uh, in, in a over-leveraged uh, panic and reversal in a short period of time because all the protections uh, did not exist. That may be a fairly standard interpretation, but there's another one lurking out there that I regard as uh, pure mischief and deeply unhelpful, and that's the view that China made us do it. Uh, and, and, and that view is, is actually quite widespread, and don't underestimate it, the China savings glut. What could we do? They were saving so much. We had to borrow, kind of the predatory lending theory, uh, that, that uh, they just forced all this bad behavior on us uh, by this uh, excessive uh, forward-lookingness uh, or whatever it is. But that is the prevailing discourse, at least, in the Fed till today, because that was, of course, Chairman Bernanke's a uh, famous uh, article in 2005 that the imbalances of the U.S. and China in trade resulted from the savings glut in Asia, uh, which uh, could only find its way to the world's most regulated, deep, and safest financial system in the world. That would be Wall Street. Um, and uh, that view actually continues to be referenced uh, on a uh, widespread basis. And we're not done with that yet, because whenever you <coughs> see global imbalances, there's a fight over adjustment between the creditors and the debtors and between the uh, surplus and the deficit countries. Uh, and generally, what you hear uh, out of uh, analysis is, uh, of course, vested position. Uh, and the United States, interestingly, is shifting from the hard-nosed uh, creditor nation, which insists on adjustment of uh, laggard deficit countries, to becoming the deficit country, which blames the creditor uh, and the surplus country for all its ills. Uh, and since the UK has been in that position before also, demanding adjustment of the surplus countries, we're just falling into uh, this, uh, this uh, transition right now. But I think in terms of roots of the crisis, these are probably the two distinctive theories that are around right now. Uh, there is, of course, a whole class of thinking that focuses more narrowly on the subprimes or the credit default swaps and so forth, which certainly played their role in amplifying the mistakes uh, and amplifying the mischief of overly expansionary monetary policy. But I think that anything which pins too much on specific dynamics of the U.S. financial markets would fail to explain a worldwide crisis, first of all, because this was actually a crisis in which there was a worldwide boom of assets, not just an American boom of assets. And that needs to be explained. And in my view, that requires an underlying monetary theory to it. By the way, the China glut uh, theory, I should have mentioned, simply doesn't work empirically because the borrowing from abroad of the United States became very large 
much faster than China's net saving became large. The U.S. was a very large borrower already in 1999, 2000, 2001, at a time when China's current account surplus was nearly balanced, actually. China was already accumulating foreign exchange reserves then, but through capital inflows to China in foreign investment, and matched by an accumulation of reserves rather than a net saving surplus. China's large saving surplus only really occurs in 2004, 2005, 2006. So the timing of that explanation is empirically wrong and I think ideologically suspect uh, in, in any event. There was also, uh, on top of this, in some places, uh, certainly the United States, a lot of fiscal irresponsibility, which dates back uh, quite a long time in the United States. And then I would uh, point to one fundamental factor. Why did this happen sociologically, not why did it happen uh, economically? And there, I think, the financial uh, factors and monetary factors are proximate causes. But the United States went through a very, uh, very unpleasant political shift in the last 25 years. Uh, where Wall Street and Big Oil, the two of them, really took a sustained control of political power in the U.S. over quite a long period of time. And you watch Wall Street sending one Treasury Secretary after another, uh, the Fed really uh, catering to uh, the Wall Street uh, dance, uh, the military, in my opinion, catering to the oil interests. And while this sounds a little crude, I don't, crude, uh, maybe that's a, <laughs> uh, I, I think it's actually uh, not wrong to see that uh, behind all of this uh, lay an extraordinary uh, imbalance of U.S. politics uh, that really lasted from the early Reagan years through uh, uh, Bush uh, one, uh, through the Clinton era, the Clinton era wasn't so much oil, but it was very heavily Wall Street, that's for sure. Uh, and, uh, and then through uh, the Bush Jr. era, which was both oil and Wall Street, so the combination got us into war and collapse and everything else. Uh, but this was a quite disastrous period where uh, politics uh, definitely paid zero attention to the poor. Uh, it paid uh, zero attention to uh, public institutions uh, in the United States that paid uh, almost no attention to infrastructure. Uh, this was very much uh, oriented towards uh, particular sectoral and sectional interests. And I think there's a very, uh, uh, very bad story involved in all of this. It has also a lot to do with our campaign financing because these were massive, massive uh, funders of politics, these two sectors and you watch that they basically funded both political parties uh, to an extraordinarily generous extent, and we're not out of it yet. So there's a deeper interplay of politics and finance here that is definitely a part of the American syndrome uh, that uh, we've not escaped. That's Act One. So that's the setup. That created a boom. Uh, and the boom was quite extraordinary, and it was quite worldwide. And it was, in my view, generated by a massively expansionary monetary policy, then multiplied by uh, financial uh, non-regulation uh, globally. And the US money center provided the financing for global banks. And so this spread into uh, virtually every stock, stock market in the world. The rise of paper wealth that resulted from all of this was quite extraordinary. Between 2000 and 2005, there was probably $30 trillion of uh, stock market capitalization uh, increase uh, as a result of uh, this financial uh, boom. There was also perhaps, I've never seen it added up, another 10 or $15 trillion of housing uh, wealth uh, in, in housing market values that you would add to that. Uh, we need to add up the net worth calculations. Uh, they're only available for some countries and, and with, uh, with a lot of comparative difficulty. But we perhaps had a wealth 
uh, expansion of 40 or 50 trillion dollars uh, suddenly, and the curve is a decisive break. It's not a gradual accumulation. It is a, an extraordinary run-up of, of wealth. This, of course, led to a massive consumption boom in many parts of the world and set us up for a massive consumption decline in many parts of the world. I put the emphasis on this because analytically we have to understand how it is that uh, this crisis became global so fast. If it's just the US housing market, believe me, if you do the numbers, it's not close to generating a global crisis. This has to be more global in its, uh, in its source. Uh, and I think that the right place to look is the generalized asset market boom uh, in stocks, in housing, and then in the late stage, also in asset prices. Uh, in oil, it came to the food, to grains, which was uh, absolutely extraordinary as well, though that was a six-month run-up and followed by a six-month uh, month collapse. It may be, interestingly, that that last stage where the world economy had been growing four and a half or five percent per year for several years, worldwide expansion, then hitting the limits on, on energy supply, hitting the limits on uh, grain reserves and so forth, played more of a role than we now recognize. Because at least to my understanding, one of the things that happened was that it became clear last year, as oil hit $147 a barrel briefly, that we would not be able to go on in this uh, miraculous age of growing 4 to 5 percent per year. When you think about that, when that realization becomes noted and you start discounting future uh, earning streams at a slower growth rate, the effect of that on asset prices can be very, very uh, powerful. Uh, so if you are a 6 percent uh, interest rate and you have 4 percent growth, then the denominator in, uh, in uh, multiplying up an, an annual dividend is uh, 0 0.06 minus 0 0.04, it's 0 0.02, it's 50 times the dividend gets priced into the, uh, into the annual flow. Uh, if the growth goes from 4% to 3%, uh, then you're uh, dividing, uh, you lose 50% uh, of, of the value of, uh, of the asset, or it becomes two-thirds uh, of, uh, uh, of the value. Um, so the effect of a slowdown of growth potential or perception of a slowdown of growth potential can get priced very rapidly into uh, declining asset prices. It wasn't just that. The housing bubble uh, had already started to burst in the United States and Spain and in other places. But what occurred in 2006 onward for a lot of reasons, mainly that this boost of asset prices was fueled by a monetary expansion which was not a sustainable uh, measure of, uh, of uh, economic growth potential, was that the prices peaked and started to decline. And with any kind of bubble, once the decline starts, then there are positive feedbacks, in other words, amplifiers to the decline that started in motion a unwinding of this asset bubble that turned out to be even more dramatic than the increase. In the end, we know what's happened up to this point, which is that all of the stock market increase of the first part of this decade was wiped out in about 24 months. So we've lost about 30 billion, 30 trillion dollars, excuse me, worldwide of stock market valuation. My guess is about 10 trillion dollars so far of housing market wealth. So perhaps a 40 trillion dollar uh, loss of wealth over a 12 to 24 month period that's essentially worldwide. This is by itself enough to give you a bad day. <laughs> uh, if nothing more, the loss of wealth of that magnitude 
compared to a world economy of about $55 trillion, is a loss of aggregate demand perhaps 4 or 5 percent of GNP. So if you've lost $40 trillion of wealth over $55 trillion, so 40 50 fifths, and every uh, dollar of wealth loses, say, uh, 6 cents of consumption uh, on the multiplier of uh, wealth uh, into consumption, then the result is uh, something around 4.5 percent of GNP loss of consumption demand. And to my mind, that's really the underlying key forcing that we're seeing in the world economy right now. A massive rise of wealth fueled by money, a massive decline of wealth as the bubble broke, leading to a massive decline of consumption that follows a consumption boom with a lot of differentiation across countries. But to a surprising extent, a drop of consumption everywhere. So the crisis, again, to say it for the third time, isn't just that the US went into recession and the demand by US consumers for the rest of the world slowed down and that led to multipliers abroad, but rather consumption fell just about everywhere because stock markets declined just about everywhere because the underlying push was a common financial signal starting with the US dollar. And the magnitude of that to lose $40 trillion of wealth translating into 4 or 5% of GNP in purchasing power is a very heavy first round blow to aggregate demand globally. Now then think of your Keynesian macroeconomics. On top of that you have accelerator effects on investment because all of those consumption goods industries now have excess capacity. And then you have overall multiplier effects uh, on consumption. So when I say 4 or 5%, that's just the impulse effect. And then as that propagates through the economy, you can have a decline of aggregate demand 5 or 10% of GNP. And that's why we're seeing such a calamitous drop of, uh, of uh, aggregate demand right now and why it's so pervasive. Now there's another theory which is, has obviously elements of truth that has to go alongside this. But I think it's important analytically for us to balance, uh, to try to assess the balance of them. The other theory is that this is a credit squeeze phenomenon. The story goes that the drop of asset market prices, particularly housing stock, worsened the balance sheets of the banks. That led to an impairment of bank capital. And then either through regulation or behavioral uh, results within the banks, a reduction of bank lending or a deleveraging because of the reduction of capital uh, at the core of the financial institutions. There's definitely some of that underway as well. That's an independent channel to a pure consumption wealth effect. We usually see it written about these days as if that's the main channel, I would say. I think the wealth effect is recognized, but the main channel is usually considered to be the financial sector uh, channel now. I mean, for me, the starting point was finance, but not the main channel of collapse. That's wealth. Whereas the usual perception of this crisis is that the banking sector is impaired. The reason why this is so important is that it also, uh, this question, it also uh, directs you to uh, whether the urgency is somehow to replace aggregate demand on some timetable or whether it's to get the banking sector working again. Of course, it is a bit of both. But there is a view that says if we could just unlock uh, the bank finance, we could go back to where we were before. And that's the theory of this bank cleanup with all the debates that are surrounding the new Geithner plan or uh, the uh, various uh, proposals uh, that are uh, underway in this country and elsewhere. There's definitely some truth to the bank capital impairment notion that this is an independent channel of contraction right now. And it was certainly a major factor 
immediately after Lehman, because that added in one more component, which was pure financial panic. When Lehman went down on September 15 last year and defaulted on short-term debts held by reserve primary uh, fund, and then this money market fund uh, broke the buck uh, and was unable to return at par the, uh, the funds deposited in it. There was a massive run on money markets, absolutely dramatic, hundreds of billions of dollars within days. And since the money markets and similar institutions are major funders of banks in the short term, major funders of commercial paper, and otherwise major makers of liquidity in the system, there's no doubt that the Lehman failure also added a liquidity crisis and financial panic on top of the bank capital impairment and on top of uh, the loss of uh, wealth. There's a lot of debate about this issue vis-a-vis -vis the lost decade in Japan, uh, the so-called uh, lost decade in which uh, Japan had slow growth during the 1990s. The claim is made that Japan didn't clean its banks, therefore it faced 10 years of low bank lending and slow growth. I'd say the academic literature comes down on the other side of this, that the problem was not actually the failure of the banks, but rather the lack of interest in spending in Japan in both investment and consumption spending. That's interesting because it says that even if you do clean the banks, you probably still have a serious wealth uh, reduction phenomenon that is going to persist. And I have to say that's my view. It's crucial to break the panic, and you do that by flooding the markets with liquidity. You make sure that there are not more defaults into the very short-term money markets, and the central banks of the world have more or less done that. You do have to clean the banks over time without question. But the expectation, in my view, uh, that if we just reestablish bank capital, that we're going to go back to where we were is a mistake, because where we were was unsustainable, and it's very hard to recreate bubbles, although Greenspan did it three times. Uh, I, I don't recommend it, actually, for the fourth time, and I don't think that we'll, we'll get there. So yes, there was a banking crisis. Yes, there continues to be a banking crisis in some of the peripheral countries. Peripheral, I mean, not to their moral value or their uh, importance of people, but to the financial system. Basically, the London financial market and the New York financial market, but especially the London financial market, as well as German and French banks, have pulled back credit from Central and Eastern Europe, from uh, Southeast Asia, from parts of Latin America. Uh, and that is creating a crisis uh, in those regions as well. And that's a banking crisis on top of, <clears throat> on top of uh, a wealth crisis. But for the world as a whole, in terms of uh, overall weight of this, I would put <clears throat> the uh, emphasis on the loss of wealth uh, and a loss of wealth that I believe is not easily reversible. So act three. What do you do about it? Uh, what is the kind of policy response when you've made this gigantic bubble and it's burst? Uh, and now uh, wealth has uh, declined sharply. The multiplier accelerator is starting. Uh, banking, a financial panic uh, was set off in September. Uh, the banks uh, have impaired capital and all the rest. It's not fun. Uh, and uh, that's what we're living through right now. So, it seems to me that there are a number of aspects of the short term to, to highlight. One is, uh, in my list, liquidity, liquidity, liquidity. We certainly don't want to uh, compound what will inevitably be a deep downturn because of consumption decline by a financial collapse. And that's what Lehman invited. So, Central banks can avoid financial collapses because they have the printing press, and they should use it. Uh, and, and that's what they've been doing. And it's important to keep liquidity going. That's different from the central banks engineering a recovery, which they can't do. It's preventing a breakdown of liquidity. In other words, bank closures uh, and uh, 
inability to roll over short-term commercial paper. That's the job of the central bank to keep that going. Central bank cannot push hard enough to make a recovery on its own $40 trillion later. And it shouldn't even try. But it should maintain liquidity. Then comes the question of fiscal stimulus, which is obviously the, the logical Keynesian uh, response to this. And on the one side, there's definitely analytical merit if C is going down and private I is going down in your C plus I plus G and X minus M sums to zero for the world as a whole, then only a rise of G or a rise of I superscript G, public investment, either government consumption or public investment or stimulus of private consumption somehow through tax policy could partly offset the wealth effect. And it became the, the, the uh, policy position of the Obama administration pretty much that uh, the more that you can do, the better in the short term because this decline of consumption is so large uh, that it needs to be counteracted by massive fiscal expansion. And of course, the central fight in the last few weeks has been between that view and a continental European view which says that we don't want to go down that road. So how does one evaluate that? I think in truth, uh, both sides have merit in, in this debate and that means that uh, a position that holds uh, that you can simply replace the consumption through government spending is probably not sound. On the other side, the idea that one does nothing is also not correct. The problem is that perhaps unlike in 1933 or 1936 when the general theory appeared, the fiscal space is problematic right now. Uh, we have very large states uh, and we have tax systems uh, that if not uh, exhausting their tax capacity are certainly pushing up against political, uh, very strong political barriers. Even in my own country, which is an undertaxed country, uh, without question, where our total level of government taxation is around 34, 35% of GNP, compared to 45% of GNP on average uh, in the Eurozone, for example, and where because of that, we're completely deficient in many absolutely vital public goods, uh, such as universal health care coverage. To just think that we can go on with massive deficits uh, and not pay any consequence because a simple Keynesian model says so is really a mistake. Obama went that route to start. Uh, he inherited a deficit of perhaps uh, $1.2 trillion though there's a lot of accounting uh, that needs to be taken into account because some of that is simply recapitalization under the, uh, the so-called TARP legislation. But he inherited a massive true cash flow deficit and then a little bit doubled down with this stimulus package of another $400 billion a year deficit, roughly uh, an $800 billion package. And we're looking at a budget deficit of $1.8 trillion dollars in FY 2009. That's actually large, <laughs> even for the US economy. And I say that uh, as advice also to all of you, always have a good denominator whenever you cite a number. And the denominator in this case should be something like the national economy. We have a vast national economy, so big numbers might not really be so big. But it turns out that even with a $14 trillion national economy, uh, 1.8 trillion is pretty large. Uh, we've not had a deficit uh, of this scale before, and we could not sustain this with uh, any kind of financial and geopolitical confidence for several years to come at this rate. So this is not the era of the Great Depression with much smaller government, 
uh, a capacity to move and also a background, which thank God is nothing as severe uh, as uh, that uh, comparison case because when desperate measures were taken in the 1930s, the unemployment rate was 25% of, of, uh, of the economy. Um, so I think that there's merit on both sides that fiscal stimulus can do something, but it actually is a mistake to think that what you do is apply a simple multiplier analysis and you're done with it. You absolutely have to learn, I mean, have to look seriously at a medium-term fiscal scenario. And the problem for President Obama right now, in, in my opinion, politically, is that he started out with a massive fiscal, uh, Keynesian fiscal view. The deficit is huge. They realized, I think, uh, a week later that this is untenable. Then they announced a steep cut in the deficit in the next four years. And this has thrown uh, the politics uh, into uh, an incredibly uh, difficult and, and unstable uh, situation right now because we don't know whether we're cutting, whether we're expanding, uh, what's justifiable. If we really have to cut the deficit, why do we increase the deficit? Uh, who owns this problem right now? So it's made, in my opinion, a bit of a political mess, uh, the way that this was done. Uh, and if it had been done in a different way of a medium-term scenario to begin with, and acknowledging that there were fiscal limits and that there was going to be a downturn, but it was a downturn of the previous four presidents, in fact, uh, and not owned uh, politically this way, I think that it would have helped the public to understand better the kinds of adjustments that need to be made. Now, in addition to all of that comes the banking sector cleanup, which I won't dwell on uh, at length except to say that, uh, except to say that I have one more act too, uh, uh, except to say that uh, what we see at play, unfortunately, still, is a Wall Street definition of a solution for Wall Street. Uh, and this, I think, is uh, deeply unpleasant uh, emotionally, uh, ethically, and economically. Uh, and this is a problem as well, because the solutions that are still being uh, proposed are solutions essentially uh, which keep the shareholders where they are implicitly guarantee bondholders galore everywhere and choose to pump in a lot of public money to clean up the balance sheets on the claim that that's the key to unlock to get the rapid economic growth going again. I'm skeptical on all aspects of this proposition, as you can hear. I don't think it's as vital to do this cleanup the way they're doing it. I don't think it's going to be the key to restoring growth quite the same way. Uh, and I also think that when you've entered a crisis through a profound lapse of political and financial ethics, that you have to have actually an ethical approach to get out of it. Because at the end of the day, a healthy economy depends on, uh, on a, at least a uh, basic societal consensus. Uh, on uh, the rules of the game, and we're losing that in the United States right now. Uh, and uh, I think that this is a, because of vast inequalities and vast abuses, and I think therefore you have to go all the way backwards to make sure that the steps and measures that you're taking look a lot better than the ones that are being proposed. Now, two more very quick points uh, on this. The emerging market squeeze in that story still isn't attended to. What about the Hungary, Lithuania, Latvia, South Korea phenomenon of the money center banks withdrawing credits? That presumably is part of what the G20 will be about tomorrow when they talk about recapitalizing, in essence, the IMF so that the IMF can extend liquidity. This does not bring thrills to anybody, one has to say. Uh, oh boy, the IMF is coming. Um, uh, coming to the rescue, just like before. Everybody's terrified. Uh, maybe they will do better this time. Uh, they have never truly uh, understood that in the middle of a 
crisis like this, loading on massive conditions antithetical to the very ones that we practice on ourselves is probably not the best way to break a panic, and we'll see whether they do better. But one final point I want to make on the short-term response. There has been, so far as I counted, zero attention to the two billion poorest people in the world. I've not heard a word. Zero. We've done four or five trillion dollars of bailouts by now. IMF money is not about the poorest people in the world. These are loans, mind you, at commercial rates. You'll hear big numbers tomorrow. Five hundred billion dollars of uh, new lending capacity, for example. But those are loans. What about for the people who are in deep and chronic hunger, about a billion people right now? What about the nine million children who will die this year or more because they're too poor to stay alive? We've heard nothing so far about them, and they're not represented tomorrow at the G20 among the countries. Maybe the uh, 250 million in India in extreme poverty are represented by India's presence. But Africa, not at all. And other very poor parts of the world, not at all. So we've not had even the makings of a global response. I've been uh, trying for months to raise a few billion dollars for uh, smallholder agriculture, and we're still pushing that. But it's, I'm, I don't know, like a cartoon where, you know, a, a child's watching a candy going by. <laughs> you know, every trillion dollars that goes by, I'm salivating. My tongue is uh, falling to the floor because we can't even get a crumb falling down yet for the poor. It just hasn't happened yet. And we've now watched maybe four or five trillion dollars being committed. And then what we hear is, but Professor Sachs, budgets are tight. We have large deficits. How could we do this? How can we afford this? And so this was so predictable, even to the point of watching the $4 billion uh, that Merrill Lynch executives stole in December in broad daylight. They called it a bonus. That's, that's taxpayer dollars. And it happened in broad daylight. And our society in the United States is so dysfunctional that not only did it not stop, it was barely noticed at the time. It, got a bit more noticed with the $166 million of AIG a couple months later. Fi go figure. I can't figure it out. But anyway, $4 billion like that, gone, but try to raise pennies for the poor, and you find out what the world's really made of. And it's a, it's a very, tough, uh, very tough thing. Now, let me finally turn to the long-term response. What might it be? Where, what, what should we be doing? Where could we be going? So my view is that this decline of consumption is going to be a prolonged one from a macroeconomic point of view, because I don't see the 40 trillion, or maybe it'll turn out to be 50 trillion at the end of the unwinding of the housing bubble, reversing anytime soon. So I think consumers are going to be cautious for a long time to come because they're going to be retiring or they're going to be trying to eat or they're going to be trying to keep their children in school and uh, spending is going to be uh, deeply limited and that's even if the banks get cleaned up a bit. So I do think there needs to be a response that's serious in terms of demand. Now the basic lesson is true from our growth models and from our Keynesian theory which is if C goes down, this really is an opportunity for I to go up. And what we should be thinking about seriously is what are the bottlenecks? Keynes pointed out brilliantly, 
that there was the paradox of thrift before the decline of C, in other words, the rise of potential saving, turns into actual investment, you get a decline of output first. And so you frustrate the actual investment that uh, could come from that counterpart. So my view of the longer term is how do we overcome the paradox of thrift and take advantage of the benefits of thrift? We were in a world that was over-consuming. Now we've stopped over-consuming. This should be good news. We've got lots of resource potential to start doing the things we really need to do on this planet. What are the things we really need to do on this planet? We need to completely reconfigure our energy systems, for example. We need, we know, trillions of dollars of investment in a sustainable energy system. We need to help a couple billion people move as dignified human beings into the urban environment in the next 25 years. That means with running water, with toilets, with sanitation, with schools, with clinics, with buildings that don't fall down on them. There's wonderful investment to be made in this world. We have no shortage of investment needs. The big investment needs are not the yachts and the fourth homes of the Wall Street executives which have gone away with no regret. But those resources are now available to do good things in the world. There was a curious article in the, New York, in the Financial Times today by a Chinese economist who said that what we really need is an investment guarantee fund so the Chinese savings could safely flow into the United States. No. We don't need that. We don't need Chinese funds to flow into the United States. We need Chinese savings to flow reliably into quality uh, urbanization in China, which is very capital intensive because hundreds of millions of people will join Chinese cities in the next 40 years. We have a continent of 800 million people in sub-Saharan Africa that is still 70% rural, that has essentially no infrastructure to speak of in large parts of the continent. No energy system, no uh, safe water, no irrigation, no roads or no all-weather roads and so forth. Wonderful investment opportunities. Some of this has to be aid. Some of this has to be financed at sub-market terms. That's okay. A lot of it, however, with clever design of project financing, better financial institutions that truly channel saving to long-term projects could be done on a market basis, just not the kinds of markets that we have right now. A lot of the work that you can do in the future is to design how Mali could create a market-based infrastructure funding over the next 40 years to build out a power sector which hardly reaches the population right now. Or how to finance a wonderful project called Desert Tech, which is a expensive, probably trillions of dollars project to provide massive solar power and other renewables in the Middle East, North Africa, and Europe uh, with uh, high voltage uh, transmission from uh, the, uh, the solar power sites uh, around the Mediterranean to, uh, to the rest of Europe. So the idea that we think very hard about converting saving potential into real investment, some of it public, some of it public-private, some of it private with public guarantees of some sort, some of it private-private but with very clever project financing, to my mind is a major area of, uh, of uh, reconceptualizing our institutions. Simply recapitalizing the banks so we can go back to a consumption binge uh, strikes me as a uh, very unfortunate way to proceed. Three more quick points. We do need monetary reform because the centrality of the dollar helped to get us into this problem. The U.S. cannot be the sole fulcrum of the world monetary system anymore. The Chinese observations last week on this point are valid, very interesting, not something that can be implemented from one day to the next. 
but definitely are worthy of study. There will be no discussion tomorrow, I believe, of monetary issues at the G20. Too hot to handle. Don't touch. But we need, especially we in academia uh, and uh, other places that uh, can handle and touch these things, need to make a very serious worldwide effort to analyze the kinds of monetary reforms that are appropriate because the dollar-based world economy can't hold the same way as it did in the Bretton Woods era. And there are many, many issues that uh, need to be analyzed. We will need a new conceptualization of banking sector regulation uh, that uh, involves systems resilience rather than monitoring individual enterprises. And finally, and I'll stop here, we do need a quite fundamental rethink of our global institutions. Uh, and the reason for that is that success in any of these ventures that I've just described, whether it's the conversion of the paradox of thrift to the advantage of thrift, whether it's financing the infrastructure over the next 40 years in emerging and poor countries, emerging markets and, and poor countries, whether it's proper banking regulation, whether it's the green technology and the renewable energy, all of that depends fundamentally on global cooperation. And that means uh, globally agreed processes, norms, standards, rules of the game, which do not yet exist. So all of this is to say LSE has a lot of work ahead and why it's so great to be here. Thanks. Okay, this is the situation. We have to finish in about 12 minutes. I regret that, we all regret that, but schedules are tight this evening for very many reasons. So, in the remaining 12 minutes, now 11 minutes, 45 seconds, I wanna take just one cluster of questions. Okay, we'll take several questions, but they have to be tight, short, and no more than 30 seconds each. Where are the mics? Right, gentlemen there, no statements, short questions, because then Jeff can have five minutes to answer them all. Okay, gentlemen over there, let's see hands. How worried are you about financial protectionism in particular, now that so many banks are in uh, virtually nationalized and public ownership, and the leaders of so many countries basically discouraging uh, cross-border lending, but lending at home? Okay, brilliant. Okay. What, what, are the chance, what are the chances of um, the cap and trade uh, proposals coming out of Congress making it into law in the next uh, six months? Yeah, lady with a hand up there. Let's see someone next. Up Sorry. where? Someone at the top? Yeah. What, is your, what are your thoughts on a global world, world currency? Where are you? Yes. Sorry, what are your thoughts on a global world currency? Global world currency. It's building up, Jeffrey. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, Alan Greenspan once wrote that uh, the gold standard would prevent indefinite monetary base expansion. So if he, th if he thought that before, would the gold standard have prevented it? And if he knew that um, non-gold standard would cause this, why, didn't, why did he have expansionary monetary policy in the way that he did? Is that fast enough? Yeah, model questions. Brilliant, yes. <laughs> Let's see if the answer yes. will be as tight. Go on, up there. Uh, Professor, <laughs> Professor Sachs, knowing what you know now um, from last autumn, would you have let Lehman Brothers fall? Okay, yeah, gentleman at the back there, right against the wall. And we want to take a few at the top. Uh, yeah, just if you could expand on what you said about monetary expansion. Uh, could you see, rather than seeing it as a policy error by Alan Greenspan, could you not see it as a response to a more fundamental lethargy of the American economy? Right, gentleman right at the back with his hands up. And then we'll have, yeah, down there in a moment. We'll take the question from the right first. So you. Go on. Yes, please. Carry on. Um, given the attention on capital inflow and then, sorry, I'm right here. Yeah. Given the attention on the need for capital inflow, uh, what do you think we can do to prevent capital outflight from developing countries and how important will that be? Okay, great. We, sh yeah, we should have hours up here, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
just curious, can you talk also about Where some, are you? some of the- At the uh, very top. Yeah. Transformative effects of sort of a green stimulus or an emphasis on uh, the environment in terms of our re response. Thank you. And the gentleman at the front. Was the governor of the Bank of England right to warn the prime minister and the chancellor away from further stimulus? What do I think about that? Yeah. One or two more yes. Gentleman here with his hand up. <laughs> I, we want to hear what you have to say as well, so we need to get these questions. Uh, Professor uh, Sachs, how about the BRICS coming to the top table? How about the what? The BRICS. Brazil, yeah. Russia, India, and China. Okay. And then the gentleman there, and we're going to end in a moment. What kind, of, what kind of role China will play in you know, introducing global currency? What role can who play? China. China, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, um, anyone who desperately feels I've treated them unfairly, <laughs> apart from lots of people I can think of, but they're not here. Uh, <laughs> um, anyone last? Okay. Yes, the lady there. This is just uh, a thought uh, right at the end. Uh, p perhaps with your writing, we could have a strong proposal so that the, in future the bonuses of or the corporate uh, executive should go towards your billion, billion dollar fund. This is great because we're, this is great because we're going to give Jeff about seven minutes to wrap it all up in Jeff. So I'm going to just finish with one final thought to you. you. Only came to global governance at the end. The problem of global governance, of course, the multilateral order, is it's sort of rooted in the 1945 settlement and was designed for a series of functions. It is now clearly not fit for purpose. It is obsolete. There are two critical issues, it seems to me. One is a problem of representation. The old Western powers are lodged in the center and they're no longer representative. And the second is the problem of funding. How do we fund global public goods and deal with global public bads on a systematic basis which allows multilateral institutions to draw in funds without just dependency on donor willingness? It's a big issue, a tough, big issue, which you left rightly to the end. We are working on it here at the LSE. Answers an email later. But well, you've got six minutes, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, no, some, kind of. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Financial protectionism. Uh, in the short term, uh, what we'll do is lend governments money to replace the funds that are being rolled off. Uh, when COM reappears in a year, two, three, we'll go back to uh, some kind of global finance. But hopefully, this short-term interbank lending market is dangerous. We've learned this time and again. We need a new regulatory framework around it. Um, in terms of cap and trade, it will not occur <clears throat> in the next six months. Uh, and when it does occur, it will be as it was in the European Union that, that uh, Obama will have to give up actually getting revenues out of this for quite a while. But there will be some kind of cap and trade system, I would guess, probably next, next year, probably very little revenue raised in it for a while, and that will be the, the way that it's done. We will not have a single global currency, uh, and that, of course, raises this issue of optimal currency area. What I do think we will have is an evolution towards dollar, Euro and an Asian, uh, some kind of uh, more coordinated Asian monetary standard over time. I also like the Chinese proposal. I had actually made it uh, independently a few weeks before, uh, only to be told, don't, no, no, that wasn't my point, only to be told, don't talk about this, uh, that uh, the SDR, which is a basket, basically, uh, of uh, the dollar, the pound, uh, the yen, and the euro, should be rebased to a much larger number of currencies, including the yuan, the renminbi, uh, including uh, the yuan and, and uh, others. And then uh, by having an international standard like the SDR, is not as a borrowing instrument, but as a unit of account, the dollar could depreciate against the SDR. The Asian currencies could appreciate against the SDR. And this would help for longer term adjustment. We need actually relative exchange rate movements, which is very hard for the dollar in a dollar based system. This is one of the conundrums uh, of, uh, of the current dollar based system. Why did Greenspan do it? 
basically, I think, because he liked his job. Uh, and uh, that uh, this was, in a way, the political business cycle operating at the central bank. Uh, as long as he could keep the economy sailing along, uh, then he could continue to be Fed chairman. And uh, I don't want to personalize it so much, uh, but I do think that they took it as their mandate, allow no slowdown. And if you say no slowdown, you'll end up skidding off the rails. And that's what I think happened, basically. Uh, in terms of uh, 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 was, the, uh, was the failure of uh, Lehman uh, the, the wrong thing to do, Ev evidently, uh, yes. Uh, and especially on the defaults on the short-term instruments. That was the mistake. Uh, chapter 11 may not have been the mistake, but what was the mistake was to allow a break of liquidity that could lead to a run. You see, we figured out not to allow bank runs a while ago. And those were the trilogy of policies that I mentioned before. <laughs> Capital adequacy standards, uh, lender of last resort, and deposit insurance. Lehman had none of those three. Uh, and uh, that, uh, uh, <laughs> th th and, and that, is, that is the real, uh, the real problem. So not having a default on the short term was probably right. Did monetary expansion represent fundamental lethargy of the US economy in a way? I'm saying it, that there could have been a slowdown, but they wouldn't allow that to happen. So if you keep pumping to avoid even a temporary slowdown, you end up with this other phenomenon of, uh, of serial bubbles. To prevent capital flight, basically, you, you need uh, investment opportunities within a country, and if uh, if uh, the macro is so unstable, then you'll naturally get private capital flowing out as well. And that's why we do need some kind of lender of last resort capacity vis-a-vis -vis these emerging markets right now. Green stimulus, very good idea. Mervyn King's warnings, yes, right. Um, <laughs> the, 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 uh, he, yes, he's saying we've got limits to what we can do fiscally because we're, we're, we're not, we just can't, easily with aging economies and rather large tax burdens as a share of GNP, expect that we can cover public debt as if it doesn't count. Uh, and I think that's the point that, that he's making and the point that, that uh, has hit the Obama administration a, as well. Uh, and when we're lectured by the Chinese, you be careful. That's our money. It's quite incredible. And we have a Secretary of State standing in Beijing begging the Chinese, keep buying our Treasury bills. You, it's very odd. Uh, and second, you know that you're near limits. Uh, and uh, though I think we should tax ourselves a lot more in the US, let's agree on that first before we get the $1.8 trillion deficits uh, as a regular thing. The BRICs are coming higher and higher after all. China and India together are 37% of the world's population. It would be odd if uh, in the medium term they weren't 37% of the world's GNP. And that's, that's what's going to happen. Uh, and that's good, in my view, uh, normal. Uh, what role can China play? It already played a good role by putting an interesting proposal on the table. But the second thing I think that China should do together with Japan, Korea, and the ASEAN countries and the Asian Development Bank is actually analyze how this could work uh, and how to, how to move closer to Asian monetary cooperation. And how about uh, putting the bonuses to funding good causes? Yes. Thank you. <laughs>